let's just get straight into it, shall we? So we've been, this month we're focusing on the gospel. We're, folk, we're using the book of Romans to talk about the gospel and to look at different ways that the gospel is good news in our bad news world. And as I'm sure we all realise, the world is in a state that could certainly do with some good news. And it is the case that the Bible tells us the good news of what God is doing about the world in its predicament, the predicament that it has always been in. And the predicament it's in now is certainly nothing new. And God has been working ever since the beginning to bring about a solution, a salvation, a redemption to the world. And the point of the series is to look at different ways that the gospel is indeed good news in our bad news world. And so to get the ball rolling, we should have a look at sort of the theme verse for our series, but also the theme verse for the book of Romans, if you will. This is Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. I'm sure many of you know it. So let's have a read of it together on the screen. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And by way of review, let me, if you heard Hayden last week and that brilliant message he preached then, let's quickly remind ourselves of what the gospel actually is. This might be my own kind of definition, but it goes this way. The good news or well, the gospel is the good news of what God has done for the salvation of the world through Jesus Christ, the true King of the world. Or if you want to unpack that a little bit more and just tease it out, the gospel is the announcement of the good news, the gospel in Greek, the euangelion, of what God has and is and will do for the salvation of the world through the life, death, resurrection, ascension, and promised return of Jesus Christ, the one true King. That's the gospel. And the gospel's got lots of different dimensions to it. And we're going to have a look at one of those dimensions this morning. So if you want a title for today's message, it's this, the gospel of community. The gospel of community. Here's something I'd like you to just notice. In a room this size, and for those of you who are joining us online as well, and also in Launceston, g'day to you down there in Tasmania, um, this room is filled with people, the vast majority of whom have given their lives to Jesus, right? If you haven't, we'll give you an opportunity later on. If you thought you were coming to the local RSL, Hang around, you'll have a great time. But most people in this room have given their lives to Jesus. So lots of individuals got saved. But as you can see, when you look around the room, when lots of individuals get saved, you end up with a community of saved people. The gospel isn't just about individuals getting saved. It is actually about this, a community of saved people or a saved community of saved people. That's one of the things that God is out for. It's one of the things that God is trying to achieve through the gospel. And a community of God's people like this one and plenty of other churches in Sydney, around Australia, around the world, this community is a kingdom community. A kingdom, a community of people who've recognised that the Lord Jesus Christ is indeed the one true King of the world, and who together are forming an outpost, if you will, of that kingdom here on earth. The kingdom of God is found in places like this, amongst a group of people like this, this kind of group here in church, and as we do our lives together during the week, over the years, the months, the years, and all the seasons of life, this kind of community is a place that the kingdom of God is found. It's where people can come into this community and see what the kingdom of God is like. 
That's what's going on in church. And if you're reading your way through Romans, one of the things that you'll find over and over again is that one of the things that Romans is about is that the, God, the preaching of the gospel produces kingdom community. The preaching of the gospel creates, brings into being a new people of God. And you'll see that over and over again in the book of Romans. One of the places you'll see it is the verse that we've already read today. Let's have a look at it again. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to whom? To everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. That simple verse is already locking the gospel into the entire Bible story. If you know your Old Testament, you'll know the Old Testament is predominantly the story of what God was doing through the nation of Israel, the people who we refer to as the Jews. And being a Jew was what made you one of God's people. Having the law of Moses, being born of one of the descendants of Abraham is what got you in. And in the Old Testament, there is an in-group and there's an out-group. The in-group are the Jews, the people of Israel. The out-group is everybody else, the Gentiles, the pagans, those who worshipped idols and false gods. But it was the people of Israel who were the in-group. They were God's people. But with the coming of Jesus and the proclamation of the good news, something remarkable has happened. The boundary line of who's in God's people and who's on the outside used to be ethnicity. It used to be the Jewish law, but now it's changed. The boundary line is now Jesus. And who's in this people of God? Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus is now in. So there's a whole new in-group when it comes to the people of God. The gospel forms a whole new group of people, a whole new people of God. And that new people of God is made up of everyone, Jew and Gentile. The old boundary lines don't count anymore. They've all been rubbed out and washed away and what God has done in Jesus and God's making a new people for himself out of all the peoples of the world. That's pretty remarkable. And as you work your way through Romans, you'll see this idea pop up on lots of different occasions. For example, if you go through chapters two and three, you've probably already encountered this, Paul makes the argument that both Jews and Gentiles are already alike and united because they're all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. But then he goes on to say, but what God has done through Jesus applies to them as well. They're unified, not just in their sin, but in what God has done for them in Jesus. And they, both Jews and Gentiles, are made right with God through what God has done through Jesus. Then if you race forward to chapter 8, there's this wonderful moment in the middle of chapter 8 where Paul talks about us being adopted into God's family into a, if you will, a Trinitarian family, that all of us are now, as out, formerly outsiders, are adopted in. God is our Father. Jesus is our co-heir, our brother. And the Holy Spirit binds us together with the Spirit of Jesus and makes our being adopted into God's family as His children real in our lives. That's, that's something we share, not just individually, but together. And then when you roll on to chapter 11, there's this wonderful picture of an olive tree. And the olive tree represents the people of Israel. And Paul paints the picture to the Gentiles in his audience. He says, this olive tree, which is the people of Israel and what God has been doing with them through history, you've been grafted in. It's not as though God got rid of the olive tree. You've been grafted into it. The story carries on. And you're now part of the story of what God has been doing for the very beginning, which has now reached its high point in Jesus. 
It's a story about a new community, a new family, a new people that embraces all the nations and people of the world. You go on to chapter 12, Paul talks about the people of God serving one another humbly through the gifts that God gives them by his spirit. And then it goes on to encourage the church in Rome and us today to love one another sincerely. And then in chapter 13, he says, owe no person anything except the continuing debt to love one another. Because when God's people love one another, the law of God is fulfilled. It's there, it's there over and over and over again how the preaching of the gospel produces a new family that loves, its, loves one another and serves one another in the power of the Spirit. That's what the gospel, one of the things that the gospel is producing. And this new family is a remarkable family in that it is both unified and diverse. We see a glimpse of it later on in the New Testament when you get to Revelation in chapter 7. John has a vision and he says in chapter 7 verse 9, after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne. If you want a picture of where all of this is headed, that's one of them. A family, a global heavenly family filled with people from all nations, ethnicities, races, language groups, historical backgrounds, socioeconomic groupings, any kind of grouping you can imagine is in there. Unified and diverse. So the, the church is this incredible picture of what the world finds almost impossible to achieve. A unity of people that doesn't suppress their diversity. Like God himself. God is, as many of you will know, a trinity. One God in three persons. So is God a unity or a diversity? And the answer is, yes. <laughs> so it's no wonder then that the people of God reflect God. A unity and a diversity. Together. That's something the world finds almost impossible to pull off. That's why the gospel is good news. Because as I'm sure we all know, living in this world, the world is rent with division, with hatred, with violence, with war, with greed, with injustice. And so much of those things travel along the boundary lines of division. But in the people of God, they are, those diverse people are unified in one new family. I don't want you to underappreciate what this is. This is a place in the way that we live our lives together, a place where what God is doing to produce a new people that reflects the fundamental character of his kingdom, his own fundamental character, is on display. Where someone who is, lives in the world with all of its division and all of its hatred and all of its polarization and all of its contention can come into a place like this and into a group like this and for perhaps the first time in their life recognize this is what it's always meant to be like. This is where we find our true home with God and with a diverse yet unified family. That's what the gospel 
is bringing into existence. Is that cool? I reckon it's pretty cool. Let me give you a story. Back in the early 80s, I was a uh, university student at the University of Sydney, and I lived in a residential college on campus. And there were a few of us who lived in that college who came to what is now the city campus of our church. And uh, we were obviously trying to reach our fellow students. And there was one guy who lived up the hall from me. His name was David. And we'd been witnessing to David for a while, and he wouldn't have a bar of it. He even came to church and walked away going, nah, I'm not interested. But one Sunday night, after we'd been to church, a whole bunch of us came back to where I was living and we're all in our, my room just sharing some coffee, you know, just having coffee, just hanging out. We weren't being particularly spiritual and he just walked around the corner and barged through the door and went, oh, you've got visitors and stayed for half an hour, uninvited, drank my coffee and just hung around and then left and went back to his room and we heard that he went back to his room and gave his life to Jesus. And so once we'd found out what had happened, we, we got a hold of him at breakfast the next day and said, what's the deal? What happened? And he said, when I was among, in the middle of you and your friends, seeing the way that you loved each other convinced me God was real. And that's what's meant to happen in church, in our connect groups, in our friendships, as we do life together. So that leaves, in my mind at least, a great big hairy question. How on earth do we live together? Right? <laughs> like it's all really nice and inspiring to say that the people of God is this unified, diverse group of people, but unity and diversity doesn't happen automatically, right? So how do we do that? It's not easy, as the last two and a half years has shown us, right? If we ever needed proving, the last two and a half years has proved it. Fortunately, the book of Romans, when you get there later on, chapters 14 and 15, deals with this issue in, really, in a really cool way because the Roman church is having its own problems because the church in Rome is a church made up of Jews and Gentiles. Make that work, people. And they're not doing it very well. So let's pick up the action in Romans chapter 14 and get a feel for what's going on in the Roman church and see if we can get some insight from this. Romans 14 verse 1 says, Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. So there's our sort of little on-ramp into the problems that the Roman church is having. They're having fights, quarrels, disputes over food, of all things. Now, Let's give some historical context to this so we can see what's really going on because food doesn't seem to be that big a deal, right? Well, in the Roman church, like in most early churches, they didn't have church buildings. They met in people's homes and they didn't have sound systems or bands or, or those kinds of things. The focal point of a church service in the first generation of the church was a communal meal. They called it a love feast. And they would share a meal together. It was one of the ways that they also contributed to the needs of the poor in their community. They share communion together. That's how they did it. So what you eat when you share a meal together all of a sudden becomes important, right? Because in this community, you've got Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Jewish believers who still keep 
the kosher food laws that they've been used to keeping themselves for all their lives and as the people of Israel for centuries. We're not just gonna drop those things. So when we come to a communal meal, we wanna eat kosher. One of the problems with that is the most pro common meat available in the Roman Empire was pork. That's a problem because <laughs> pork is banned in the Jewish food laws. What's worse is that whenever you did get meat served at a meal, meat wasn't very common and was rather expensive. So typically the only way you get to eat meat is if a wealthy aristocrat in your town or city, in order to win some fame for themselves, held a festival and fed the population out of their own purse. That's when they would buy animals and have them slaughtered and hand out the meat to the population. The catch is, when the animals were slaughtered, they were slaughtered in a religious sacrifice to the pagan gods. So the meat on your plate has been sacrificed to an idol. So should you eat it or not? It's a good question, right? Should you eat it or not? If you're a Jew, the answer's easy, of course not, because it's probably pork anyway, and there's no way I'm having anything to do that's gone anywhere near an idol. But this is not a trivial question, because on the one hand, you've got people who, for whom keeping God's commands is really, really important. And let's not lose the sight of the fact that keeping God's commands is really important. And not having anything to do with idols False gods is probably also pretty important. So on one side, you've got people going, no, this is really important. I can't eat what you've put in front of me. And then people on the other side going, hang on, Jesus has set us free. So give me that pork. And these two groups are fighting. They're having a disagreement. And not just a district, they're splintering the church. And we hear it, we read about it here in this passage. Paul talks about the weak and the strong. That's not Paul's language, that's their language. That they fling at each other. We're the strong over here because we believe in liberty. You're weak because you're stuck in religion. And probably the other way around, right? So what does Paul tell them about how to work this out? Well, let's work our way through chapter 14 and we'll see what Paul's got to, got to say about this. So we're gonna do a Bible study. You ready for Bible? Who's got their actual Bible here? Give me a wave if you got your actual Bible. Turn to Romans 14, we'll do it together. That'd be awesome. So let's pick up the action then in the very beginning. Let's see the things that Paul urges the Roman church to do. Firstly, he says in verse one, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. So what's the first thing he says? Accept the person who believes differently to you. Not just accept them, welcome them. Not just into friendship, welcome them to your table. First thing, accept them. Even the person whom you think that their opinions demonstrate that they are somehow spiritually, morally, or intellectually weak. Accept them, welcome them, first one. Second thing he says, don't get into quarrels over disputable matters. So already from the outset, decide, I'm not gonna quarrel, I'm not gonna quarrel, I'm not gonna quarrel. All right, that's probably a good thing to do, I'm not gonna argue but not gonna quarrel or argue about what? Disputable matters. Well, what's a disputable matter? Well, I suppose very simply, anything you can have a dispute over, which is basically everything. Well, let's be a little bit more focused. A disputable matter in the Bible would be a matter or a topic about which genuine believers can have different points of view and still be Christians. Right? 
Some of you are familiar with a, a quote attributed to St. Augustine, but probably to some 17th century German. Where are the Germans in the house? All right, three of you. <laughs> it says, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. You've heard that before? The disputable matters are the non-essentials in the middle. There's, there are some essential things that we as believers must believe to even call ourselves a Christian. You know, like Jesus, Son of God made flesh, the Trinity, the Bible as the authoritative and inspired Word of God, that God is in, at work to save the world which is alienated from Him, etc. Et There's some central things which Christians have always believed from the very beginning. Those are the essentials. But there's lots of non-essentials. There are lots of disputable matters. There are lots of things where genuine believers who believe the essentials can be on opposite sides of a matter. And Paul is saying, accept the person on the other side. Welcome them. and Don't quarrel with them. He goes on to say in verse 2, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servant stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. This is only going to get more challenging, sorry. <laughs> and I put myself in the frame as well, so we're all in this one together. What is Paul saying here? Don't do the normal thing. Don't the person who believes differently to you or acts and acts out their beliefs differently to you, whose opinions are different to yours, don't judge them. Don't condemn them. Don't treat them with disdain. Why? Because they're not accountable to you. They're accountable to Jesus. Because Jesus is their master, not you, not me. They're going to have to give an account of their lives to Jesus, not to me. And so am I. <laughs> right? And you know what? Whenever I treat someone with contempt or disdain or with judgment, I'm going, Pah, out of here with you. Kind of. That's kind of the sentiment, right? But Paul says, but Jesus is able to make them stand. What's Jesus trying to achieve in their life? Standing. What does your judgment and con contempt treat them with? It's trying to undermine whatever it is that God's trying to do. Don't do that. Verse 3, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. There's something that's remarkable in this passage for its absence, and that is any attempt by Paul to win people over to his point of view. Paul doesn't do it. Not only does he not do it, he tells, actively tells his audience, and don't you do it either. He said, instead, be convinced in your own mind and let someone else be convinced in their own mind. Why? Because whatever your opinion is and whatever behavior your opinion produces, at the end of the day, that is your offering of worship to the Lord. That's who is most important here in relation to their opinion and their behavior. What does Jesus think about that? Because the way that we live our lives is our offering of love, worship, and devotion to the Lord. And is encouraging each of us, whatever your opinion is, hold it and carry it in such a way 
that it's going to be an act of devotion to the Lord, not an act of division amongst his people. Right? <laughs> Verse 6, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. You've got your opinions. I've got my opinions. Our opinions guide our behavior. But let's make sure that the way we do all that is being done to the Lord. Because let's face it, you and I are going to have appear before Jesus and give an account for how we lived our lives with our opinions. That's challenging stuff. So here's the question. When you and I are going to appear before Jesus and give an account of our lives, what is it that Jesus wants? What's going to please him? Well, Paul goes on to say, verse 13, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make your mind up not to put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. What's more important is not my opinion and what it is and how rigorous it is and how well thought through it is and how well informed it is. What's most important to Jesus is how I carry my opinion and its effect upon others. Does the way that I carry and hold my opinion help people live their Christian lives or make it more difficult? Does it create unity or does it create division? Verse 14, I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. There's Paul's actual opinion. He's not bothered by food. He's on the freedom side of things, right? But if anyone regards something as unclean, for them it's unclean. This is Paul not actually fighting the issue. Verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Or let me rephrase that. If your brother or sister is distressed by your opinion and how you hold it, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your opinion destroy someone for whom Christ died. Wow. You see, we live in a world, in our Western world, in our Western education system, where, we, where we're encouraged to develop our own opinions and hold our own opinions and live faithfully to our own opinions. Awesome, great. But in the kingdom of God, there's a value that is supersedes your and my right to our opinion, which is the way that our opinions affect others and build or undermine the work of God. Because what's the work of God? Because what's the work of God? A unified yet diverse family of people. Paul talks about the strong and the weak. Let's think about that for a moment. In an opinion that I hold, I hold that opinion because I think it's the right one, right? You do the same. You don't hold an opinion because you think it's wrong. You hold it because you think it's right, which means it's well-informed, it's well thought through, it's strong, it's robust, it's compelling, it's persuasive. You think you're right. And that someone who doesn't believe what you believe is wrong, right? In other words, when it comes to our opinions, we all think we're the strong and they're the weak, right? And because we're the strong, we should help the weak see the error of their ways. Right? Problem is, they think they're right. And they think you're wrong. That they're strong and you're weak and their service to you 
is to help you see the error of your ways. Can see, this is not going to go well. His, and we think that being strong or weak is a matter of the rightness or the passion of our, or the well-informedness of our opinions. But for Paul, and I think for Jesus, what counts as strong is not how good your opinions are, but the way you conduct yourself with people who believe differently. That's the litmus test for being strong or weak. And let's push that thought a little bit further. If being strong is about how I conduct myself with my opinion around people who believe differently, what does Paul encourage us to do? Down in verse 20, he says, all food is clean but it's wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother or sister to fall. You see, in our modern world, we think strength is about having the best, most well-informed, well-in-thought-through in opinion. But in the kingdom, that's not strength at all. The strong is not the person who's got the best opinion. The strong is the person who is prepared to accept limitations to their freedom for the sake of blessing another. That's what strength is in the kingdom of God. Let me say it again. To be strong in the kingdom of God is to accept limitations to my freedom for the sake of others who believe differently to me. That's strength. It should come as no surprise then, as Paul goes on to say at the beginning of chapter 15. He says in verse, beginning of 15, he says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbours for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. As is nearly always the case when it comes to the Christian life, Jesus is our example. Jesus had all truth and all freedom and all authority, all power. He had it going on. If anyone was strong, it was Jesus. And how did Jesus outwork his strength? By allowing his freedom to be limited, constrained taken away in his death on a cross for a world that hated God so that they could be saved. That's the example on how we should hold our opinions. And if we can be like Jesus on those things, we will find that this family of people will indeed be that unified and diverse new people of God who shows to the world this is what the gospel is all about. Amen. Can we stand together? Shall we pray together? Because I don't know about you, but I need some help. I need as much help as I can get from the Lord and from you to help me get better. Can I give you just, just one closing thought before we pray? This is a challenging passage of Scripture. 
And I haven't answered anywhere near all of the questions that you've probably thought of as, as we were going through it. You've probably got a ton of them. Here's what I'd recommend. Sit down with someone and this passage of Scripture and read it together and work through it together and allow the message of the Scriptures to shape our hearts, our character and our lives, right? That's what connect groups are for, to do exactly that. And if you're up for it, let me take it just one step further. Sit down with the, this passage of Scripture with someone you disagree with. <laughs> and allow the Scripture and the authority of the Word of God together to shape the way that the two of you are going to be in relationship together. Amen? Because that's what the Bible's for. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you have adopted every single one of us here in this room and online into your family. We pray that you would continue by your Spirit to do your work to make us that unified and diverse people that reflects your glory and the goodness and power of your gospel to a world that so desperately needs to hear good news. So Lord, we make ourselves available to you. We ask you to change us where we need to change. Lead us to repentance where we need to repent. Lead us to forgive where we need to forgive. And above all else, allow, enable us to prioritise what is most important to you. Your kingdom, your people, your gospel, your work in the world and a faithful church said together, Amen and Amen. <laughs> Sam, over to you. Duncan, um, last time you preached, I said I didn't enjoy the message because you spoke on forgiveness, uh, but I thought it was very important. And can I say no different with this message? Um, anyone uh, say Amen or ouch to that? <laughs> it should be. I want to give everyone opportunity uh, that's here, those of you that have joined us online. If, if you've never surrendered your heart to Jesus, you know about Him, but you've never experienced His actual grace, love and His forgiveness. You've never actually acknowledged that you've sinned and you need forgiveness and asked Him to do that. Then it's really, really important that you, you just give me your attention just for a moment. God loves you. He loves you. And if you want to know how much God loves you, then you only have to look at what Jesus has done for you, for all of us. He was counted as guilty, not for what He'd done wrong, but for what we'd done wrong. The punishment that was meant for us, He took upon Himself by dying on the cross and paying the price for not His sin, but our sin. And why did He do that? It's so that God could take our guilt and our sin and put it on Him. So that when we receive Jesus, God can take His grace, His forgiveness, His right standing with the Father and give it to us. You don't have to be separated from God. You don't need that missing piece in your life anymore. Because Jesus is here this morning and He is reaching out Himself and He is inviting you to accept Him as Lord and Saviour. And maybe you've done that, but you've walked away from God. Maybe you got caught up in whatever and it just hardened your heart and you need a soft heart again because you know you're being, your heart is separated from God. Wherever you sit, I'm gonna pray a prayer. I'm gonna ask all of us to pray it out loud. And if that is you, if that is you, then I want you to pray this prayer with us, asking God to forgive you of your sin and to come into your life, amen? So let's pray this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I thank You that You love me. I have sinned and I know I fall short. So I ask that You will forgive me of my sin and that You would come into my life and You would become my Lord and Saviour. Thank You that I'm now forgiven and I'm now a child of God. In Jesus' Name. And everyone said, can we celebrate? Thank you. Can we celebrate?
we want to we want to give you. I'm going to pray for all of us. So please don't move just yet. But we want to celebrate with you. We want to give you this Bible on your on your way out. If online you put I prayed that prayer, then we'll get we'll get in touch with you. And look in the Bible's actually this little bookmark. And why this is important is because it gives you a way for you to let us know who you are, because we would love to continue to help you with the decision that you've made. Is that okay? Fantastic.